always better to have the hand at the beginning um, rather than to wait expectantly and in, 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 uh, uh, fruitlessly for a hand at the end. Uh, uh, I uh, should say that I am, um, as you said, I'm, I teach in the economics department and I'm also at this point um, uh, the co-chair of Montana Conservation Voters. Um, which is uh, coordinating a statewide or, uh, effort on, uh, to form a coalition of uh, environmental groups to work on energy policy questions. And so as a result of that, I have been sort of immersed in the politics of, uh, of energy policy now for a, for a while. And um, basically, the talk that I'm going to give today is uh, the result of kind, of kind of the ruminations that I've uh, engaged in. It's, it's part of that process. Um, so of course, I'm not speaking on behalf of Montana conservation voters. And in fact, I, in some respects, I think disagree with some of the things that we're doing. Uh, but um, uh, that is at least the sort of the context uh, in which I, I make these remarks. If I'm going to talk today about a responsible state energy policy, and I, and I was the one that chose that topic, responsible. Um, I think I need to start by giving you some notion of just what I think responsibility amounts to when it comes to policy making. The underlying concern of this lecture series is the building of a just and sustainable future. And I imagine that we can all agree that a responsible policy should work toward that end. Although I also imagine that a just present is important as well. Uh, I also think that our concern for sustainability derives in large part from our concern for justice, uh, in this case, inter intergenerational distributive justice. Plainly put, we want our grandkids to inherit a habitable earth. So maybe we should equate being responsible with being just. That would be fine, but when it comes to decisions about justice, economists famously demure. We say that we are no better qualified than anyone else to say what is just and what is not. We may be well positioned to say who will bear the cost and who will gain if, for example, we open the Rocky Mountain front to natural gas exploration. But whether the incidence of those gains and costs is just or not is really for someone else to decide. No, in evaluating policy, economists <coughs> must prefer to focus on questions of efficiency. It is not who gains and who bears the costs, but are the gains large enough to justify incurring the costs? This question usually provokes polite, polite or not so polite stifled yawns from those inclined to think in ethical terms. Uh, but I uh, would argue that, if, that efficiency is a sort of virtue. At least it's op opposite, which is profligacy and waste is a vice. Occasionally we recognize this as when, for example, we say that driving a hybrid or commuting by bike is the responsible and virtuous thing to do. But usually when economists are fretting about whether a particular policy is efficient or not, most normal people are worried about whose ox is getting gored. Here's an example. We know that we burn too much gasoline in this country. One way of dealing with the problem is to impose tighter mileage standards on automakers, or to put it uh, less politely, to get the damn SUVs off the road. Another way would be to tax gasoline, push its price up to, say, $5 a gallon, and let everybody figure out how they want to get along with less. Most economists, I suspect, would vastly prefer the latter policy on efficiency grounds. But the public debate won't be about efficiency. It will be about whether the tax is fair for low-income households, or whether the mileage standards are fair for the automobile worker, automakers or their workers, whether the people of Detroit are going to be made to suffer unduly, um, and so forth. So I'm sort of stuck. Efficiency, which I'm supposed to know something about professionally, isn't very relevant for most people when they are thinking about what a responsible policy is. And justice, or at least what they think of as justice for them, is what most people do find relevant, and I'm not supposed to know anything about it. So I'll settle for this. Since the Governor's Energy Conference last September, several proximate goals for state energy policy have percolated to the surface, along with a whole raft of proposals on how those 
uh, goals might be pursued. I'm going to describe those proximate goals and leave it to you to decide how well they serve the cause of a just and sustainable future, or perhaps more generally, the public interest. I will also try to describe in broad terms the proposals on the table and how effective I think they may be in the pursuit of the goals, understanding that effective and effectiveness and efficiency are closely related. Responsible state energy policies, then, will be ones that effectively pursue those proximate goals that promote the public interest, and specifically a just and sustainable future. It will be up to you to figure out just what those policies might be. So turning to the goals, so, to, so turning to the goals, we want, or at least some of us say we want, a state energy policy that, first and foremost, reduces the economic damage done to families and businesses by rising energy costs. We usually say here that we want low-priced, reliable energy. But for reasons I will explain in a minute, I think that the pursuit of low prices is a waste of time. Uh, we want an, a state energy policy that promotes the state's economic development. We want a state energy policy that protects the state's water, air, and land. We want a state energy policy that contributes to the arresting of global climate change. And we want a state energy policy that reduces U.S. dependence on imported energy, which means basically oil. Now, not all of these goals are equally salient in public discussion of energy policy. It's evident that they are not all mutually consistent, and not everyone agrees that they are all worthwhile or sensible. But they are on the land, and so need to be paid attention to. Also on the land are numerous proposals for how these goals might be met. At the risk of oversimplifying, I will place these proposals in one of three categories. And these are, first, on the supply side, to increase the production of non-renewable fossil fuel-based energy. The glamour child in this category is the governor's proposal to produce diesel fuel and perhaps other liquid products from coal, although coal-fired production of electricity using a variety of technologies is also under discussion. And there are also, of course, coal bed methane proposals, natural gas exploration, and a number of others. Again, on the supply side, uh, another proposal is to increase the production of energy from renewables notably electricity from wind and hydropower and transportation fuels from biomass. On the demand side, conservation and increased energy efficiency um, are, are proposals. Concretely, this may involve anything from the design of transportation systems to energy retrofits of government buildings to tax incentives for the purchase of energy efficiency appliances to changes in building codes. Let me take the goals in turn and ask this simple or maybe not so simple question. Can we reach them? Is there something in this grab bag of proposals that will allow that to happen? Take then our desire to reduce economic damage done to families and businesses by rising energy costs. I believe that this is going to be hard and that our options are limited. Specifically, I believe that policies which work to increase the supply of energy, whether renewable or otherwise, are fundamentally a waste of time and resources and accordingly not responsibly conceived, at least if what we have in mind is helping people avoid the energy crunch. The reason is that Montanans largely buy and sell energy in national markets. This is, a, this is particularly true in transportation fuels markets, and less so in, electri in electricity markets, even though that is changing. In these markets, we are price takers and not price makers, the little tail of a big dog we cannot wag. Even a relatively large effort on our part to increase the production of energy would be a drop in the bucket and have very small impact on prices in national energy markets. Consider the governor's proposal to develop a coal to diesel plant in Otter Creek near Ashland. Just what the scale of this development might be is not clear, but take the example of a, a very large complex costing at a minimum $6 billion, uh, and estimates go from 6 to $24 billion, using 20 million tons of coal a year, which is more than half of what Montana currently produces, requiring the strip mining of more than 11,000 acres of land during the life of the plant, and consuming 20% of the annual flow of the water in the Tongue River. Now that's uh, pretty large. Such a plant would produce 80,000 barrels a day of diesel fuel, 
which sounds like a lot, but in fact equals less than four tenths of one percent of U current U.S. daily consumption of refined petroleum products. By the time such a plant were built, consumption would be higher, U.S. Con national consumption would be higher, of course, and the plants share correspondingly lower. Much bigger plants are imaginable, I suppose, even plants big enough to lower prices, but the impact on land, water, and air, and on global warming gas emissions of such plants is unlikely to be tolerable. I believe that much the same is true of renewable energy production, particularly of biomass-based transportation fuels. The scope for increased production is simply not great enough to significantly impact prices. On the demand side, policies that help Montanans conserve and use energy more efficiently can reduce the impact of the energy crunch, not by reducing demand and prices. Once again, we have to recognize the fact that energy prices are largely beyond our control. Uh, but by promoting investments that we need in order to get along comfortably with less. Clearly the key here is to find conservation investments that really pay for themselves in lower energy spending. For a variety of reasons, I believe that private markets operating alone fail to identify many of the opportunities for such investments. And responsible government policies should be built around the identification and reduction of such failures. I also think it is important to recognize that a conservation-based strategy has important limitations. We can, after all, only become so efficient, and after we do so, a, gro a growing global energy shortage means that energy prices rise mean inexorably if a glowing uh, cr shortage means that energy prices rise inexorably. We will be back to where we started in short order. This is a phenomenon that was illustrated vividly by the Club of Rome report many years ago, but which tends to be forgotten. Obviously, it is not a problem that Montana can solve on its own. When it comes to economic development, a simple rule to bear in mind is that any energy policy that helps us as energy consumers cope with rising energy costs through conservation also contributes to our economic well-being. And in that sense, it's not just a means to an end, more development. It is development. But of course in Montana we are not just energy consumers, we are also producers, and potentially rather large scale producers at that. Uh, excuse me. For many Montanans, and among them I would certainly include the governor, producing more energy means economic development, and that specifically means more and better paying jobs. I suspect that for most public officials in the state, and for most of the citizens who elect them, it is a foregone conclusion that job creation is a worthwhile and responsible object of public policy. Jobs and job creation and local economic growth indeed become the coin of the realm in evaluating the outcomes of all sorts of public decisions in which we might normally expect other considerations to be determining. Whether or not to close down a <coughs> nuclear missile base, for example, or build ski areas on the edge of wildernesses, or allow construction of Las Vegas-style gambling meccas. The problem here is not just that job creation as a public value is clashing with other public values. It's that the public value of job creation, its ability to contribute to our economic well-being, even the well-being of our poorest citizens, is little <coughs> understood and vastly overrated. This is not an easy pill to swallow, I know, and the situation is complex, but suffice it to say that the history of mining and energy booms in the West, and more recently the impacts of rapid growth in the Rocky Mountain region, should give us pause when grand projects or thousands of jobs are put on the table. One response to this argument might be, and usually is, easy for you to say. After all, I, and indeed most of us in this room, live in Montana's fertile crescent a group of counties that sweeps from Flathead in the northwest, south and east to Yellowstone and Billings. These counties have experienced rapid growth in the past decade or so. But most energy development, whether of coal or renewables, would take place in the east where things have gone, not gone anywhere near so well. It is possible that small scale, geographically dispersed production of energy could help arrest the decline of communities in this region of the state. But a very large-scale industrial complex for turning coal into diesel 
would not retard the decline of the local economy of southeastern Montana. It would obliterate it. The job numbers would no doubt look better, or at least bigger, but the aspirations of current residents of the region to build sound and sustainable communities would go by the boards. Consider now the problem of global climate change. I will take it as a well-established that climate change is really happening, that its effects are destructive in the world at large and in Montana in particular, and that its causes are mainly emissions of carbon resulting from the production of energy from fossil fuels. Not everyone agrees with these conclusions, notably the President of the United States and some of his advisors, but as I say, I will take it as well established all the same. The seriousness of climate change is widely recognized, including by Governor Schweitzer, who has asked Richard Opper, the director of the Department of, of Environmental Quality, to form a task force to investigate how the state should respond to global warming. At the same time, a large coalition of environmental organizations, that's the one that I referred to and I'm at least partially responsible for, is asking the governor to place the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions at the top of the state's energy policy agenda. How might that be done? Well, obviously, conservation and greater energy efficiency have that effect. <coughs> the replacement of fossil fuel-based energy systems with renewables does as well, although just how much so is a devil in the details sort of problem. Specifically, some critics of biomass-based fuels have argued that net reduction of carbon emissions that result from replacing petroleum with biomass is less impressive than we might expect, at least given the amount of fossil fuel currently consumed in the cradle-to-grave life cycle of carbon life cycle of ethanol and biodiesel uh, diesel or, or, or bio-based fuels. The governor has argued that even coal to diesel will have the effect of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Although here, a critical question is whether carbon that would otherwise be emitted in the liquefaction process can be sequestered, that is, pumped into the ground somewhere and safely forgotten. Uh, with sequestration, energy could be derived from coal liquefaction with significantly lower emissions than those from a typical coal-fired power plant. But if, as seems to be the case, diesel from coal is used to replace diesel from petroleum rather than electric power, the net reductions in life cycle carbon emissions per vehicle mile traveled will not be very great. It is important to remember here that while it might be possible to sequester carbon for the manufacturing stage, burning coal-based diesel in cars will produce the same amount of carbon as burning petroleum-based diesel in cars. And if large-scale production of synthetic diesel encourages us, that is, the world, to continue to drive large fuel inefficient vehicles more, the situation can only get worse. Governor Schweitzer has also suggested that a coal to diesel industry in Montana might help solve the climate change problem by serving as a role model for others, and particularly for China, which has very large coal reserves, on how to, quote, do it right, unquote. This strikes me as frankly bizarre. Having a lot of coal may make us potential coal exporters, but it doesn't contribute in any obvious way to making us technology exporters. If and when the Chinese decide they want to grapple with the problem, I suspect they will turn to the many thousands of engineers that graduate from Chinese universities every year. Whether we view the task of reducing carbon emissions as an obstacle or an opportunity is important. For most governments, reducing carbon emissions is seen as quite costly. President Bush, for example, pulled the United States out of the Kyoto Agreement for just that reason and a recent EU report estimated the cost of reducing emissions at several percentage points of GDP and significantly more costly if the EU goes it alone. Um, excuse me. Uh, it, it goes it alone rather than participating in a concerted worldwide effort. The problem here is that if nations or states like Montana take stock of the situation they will usually conclude that controlling emissions is costly and the gains, in terms of a reduced pace of climate change, vanishingly small. Uh, it goes without saying that acting alone, Montana and indeed most states and nations, can do nothing to stop climate change. 
As a result, every state has a dominant strategy, which is to let every other state pick up the burden of re reducing emissions, but not to reduce its own. Need I say that the outcome of this sort of non-cooperative playing of the game is highly destructive. Its dynamics uh, are those of an arms race. The lesson I draw from all this that is, is that if Montana commits itself to reducing greenhouse ga ga gas emissions by itself, that may, may feel like the responsible thing to do, and in, of course, in a way it is. But if we really take seriously our responsibility to play a significant role in arresting climate change, we have to recognize that going it alone is a pretty feckless and ineffective strategy. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is fine, but it needs to be accompanied by an effort to forge a national coalition of states who agree to do the same. Simply put, we can't count on them not to behave like President Bush. It would be best, of course, if the federal government was prepared to make this effort, but it isn't. Much the same reasoning applies to the idea that Montana's energy policy should be driven by the goal of promoting United States energy independence. Governor Schweitzer has argued that this indeed would be one of the positive outcomes of coal to, de de to diesel development. It's possible the governor is making this argument opportunistically. It certainly sounds good, but it doesn't make much sense. I don't think that there is much at all on either the conservation or the production side that Montana can do to reduce U.S. energy imports. In the case of synthetic diesel production, moreover, I think it is important to understand that, quote, increasing U.S. energy independence, unquote, can also be thought of as, quote, capturing market share from the world's most powerful cartel, OPEC, unquote. And I know who I would vote for in that particular face down. I am not sure how much effort we want to put into working for energy independence, but if we think it's important, we cannot go it alone, but again, must rely on the federal government or cooperative agreements among the states. And in my opinion, any such national or cooperative effort must be conservation or renewables based. Any other approach would not be acceptable in light of our concerns about climate change. I will conclude with a brief comment about uh, local environmental impacts on water, land, air, wildlife, recreation, and so forth of energy policy. Most proposals for increasing energy production have such impacts, although they vary in severity. In the case of large-scale coal to diesel production, or for that matter, coal-fired electricity generation, natural gas development, or coal bed methane extraction, these impacts and the means by which they might be mitigated have been and are being widely debated. There is no consensus at this point that these energy resources can be developed responsibly. The environmental community is much more optimistic about the possibility of developing renewables responsibly, but it would be a mistake to think that there is unanimity on this score. For example, for example, nationally, David Pimentel and Ted Patsek have argued that large-scale production of biomass-based fuels will lead to intense pressures on agricultural systems, soils, and food production, and make a relatively small net contribution to energy supplies. On this campus, Professor DeLuca in the Forestry School has raised many of these same issues, and I'll just tell you, you can uh, get a chance to hear him on this topic at a philosophy forum in April. Um, for another example, Trout Unlimited, Idaho Rivers United, American Rivers, the Clark Fork Coalition, and other organizations have questioned whether hydropower can be responsibly relied on. By contrast, conservation and increased energy efficiency appear to have low, a relatively low environmental impacts. <coughs> if there is a bottom line to this rambling discussion, I imagine you by now have either guessed it or fallen asleep. The centerpiece of a responsible state energy policy should be the promotion of more conservation and greater energy efficiency. My argument is, I believe, fundamentally one of practicality. Supply-side policies simply won't work. They won't reduce the cost of energy to Montana's families and businesses. In the main, they won't promote healthy economic development. Right now, at any rate, they can't be undertaken without significant environmental impacts and they won't significantly impact global warming or energy dependence. My other conclusion is that if we care about global climate change and energy independence, 
and I believe we certainly should, both for our own sakes and as citizens of the world, then we have to reach out and seek cooperative agreements with other states and maybe nations. Going it alone and doing the right thing may feel responsible, but if it amounts to turning our backs on the problem, it really isn't responsible. Think of it this way. If you observed large numbers of cars speeding through a school zone, would you consider the matter resolved if you alone slowed down? Uh, I'm going to stop there and uh, we'll have a discussion. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Please speak up. The, uh, if, if I said anything wrong, by the way, it's his fault. <laughs> it, uh, it seems to me that, that a lot of states can appear to be going it alone, but we have in the Pacific Northwest, or beginning with California, Washington, Oregon, etc., uh, a movement at the state level to do what the federal government isn't willing to do. And I assume that that's not just a matter of spitting into the wind, that, that uh, there's the expectation that other states will join in and then that effect will ultimately be uh, that the nation as a whole will, will respond and, and, and follow suit. Uh, I guess that, I mean, this is far outside of either of our realms, economics, although the, the individual acting alone, I mean, somebody at some point has to start acting. Uh, and there is a, a demonstration effect or there is an impact of that on then how other people may behave too. Uh, I, I guess I don't see it as an either or, either you act alone or you act in unison. Uh, one can act alone and encourage other people to do the same. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I didn't want to suggest that, that it would be all right to say do nothing uh, if you can't act in unison. I mean, I think you, you do go ahead and make that initiative. And um, it actually is, I think, Tom, economics, I think it's a game theory. Um, and I think that um, the lessons of game theory are that um, this kind of game rarely gets successfully played um, um, on the basis of um, that kind of demonstration of goodwill, uh, unless the game gets to be repeated indefinitely over and over again. Um, well, I, 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 I but, over, <laughs> but it has but, to be okay. able to be repeated. Right. Yeah. Uh, but but the other uh, I think the other uh, observation you might make about that is you know, it, it, it it's it's uh, Obviously, we have to have some kind of faith. Um, uh, we, uh, if we're going to take that approach, or that sort of demonstration approach, or, or um, role model kind of approach, um, you know, it, it, that's nice to do, and it's nice to be optimistic about it. I think we also have, sort of, on the on the other side, we do have George Bush, and we also do have um, the. Uh, I'm, I'm, we also have lots of examples of states engaging in sort of bigger your neighbor types of, of policy interactions with one another, of which, the, you know, for example, uh, you know, competitive tax cutting to attract um, industry is a, is a case in point. So, you know, I, I, how optimistic we should be about that, I, I don't know. I, I, I think we should go ahead and, and, um, and you know, act responsibly in the sense of, of um, of trying to cut our emissions, trying to trying to cut our uh, reduce the impact that we're having on the global climate, um, but I think we should also ne ne never lose sight of the fact that we are actually in a da a dangerous we are in, a, in a sort of a potential prisoner's dilemma type of a of a game. I you know I it, I think it would be interesting for people who. Who are thinking about this problem from an ethical point of view? Is to say, what is it? What does an ethical player, non-cooperative player of the prisoner's dilemma, do, as opposed to a a, a, uh, 
as opposed to selecting the, do the, the usual dominant strategy. Yeah. Perhaps it's not the question for an economist, but given that maybe business magazines are calling Montana's deregulation a soap opera, what, would, what's your perception from the coalition, obviously being in touch with the Governor's Task Force, on Montana's credibility as an energy policy leader and coalition builder, especially in the West. What was my, my perception of yeah, that? Perception. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know what to say to that. Um, I, um, um, the, the For reasons that I don't fully understand, at least in the media, the governor appears to be cutting a fairly wide swath. Um, and um, I suppose that that might serve as the basis for the state exercising some kind of credible leadership. Um, I, do, I do not, don't know, however, what kind of legs that, um, that has. Um, and I, you know, I, ha I have some, I have concerns about uh, the, uh, sort of fundamental soundness of the approach he takes to public policy. I, 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 think, I think that the kind of leadership role that I'm t talking about here requires a, 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 a sort of, um, maturity that I'm not sure that we'll get out of Helena. Uh, my mom used to say that it was easier to criticize than to create. And I didn't hear in your uh, lecture how conservation and uh, renewable base was uh, any data on how that's going to meet the need that we have in a peak oil environment and global warming and everything else. How do you see uh, your idea of being better than anyone else's? How do I see conservation yeah. being what, better than? Yeah, what's the data that would support that conservation and renewable energy is going to give us enough energy to continue our economic uh, reliability on energy to progress and, and evolve our lifestyles? Well, I don't, I don't know what data exactly uh, would, uh, would be convincing to you. Um, I, I could prevent, pr certainly present you with data, I think, that would be, that, that I would hope would convince you that, um, that Montana, in fact, does deal in a national energy market, that most of, most of our, that the terms and conditions under which we acquire energy are dictated in a national energy market, and that our ability to impact that energy market is quite small. Um, and I, and, and I, and, I don't have you know, slides or data, but I think I could. I think I, I, I'm going to have. I do have them. I, they don't have them here, but I do have them. I ha we have. We can, for example, trace out um, the pattern of movement of prices, energy prices in Montana, and its relationship to the pattern of movement of energy prices in the rest of the country. And I th think you'd see, particularly when it comes to. Um, uh, Transport fuels that the, those they are very tightly tied together. Um, those are highly integrated markets, uh, and so I, I reason from that to the conclusion that um, that our ability to impact those markets, or simply uh, t taking, uh, for example, the size of Montana's energy production or energy use in comparison to the size of national uh, energy markets, to the size of imports, to the world production of, of, of energy. Um, yeah, it's, just a, it's just a question, I mean, the data is just a question of relative magnitudes. Um, and, I don't, and I don't think that there's too much doubt about it. Um, I'm, it what I c probably can't present you with maybe is, is, is evidence that, that there are abundant conservation opportunities that are going to make a big difference to Montana families and businesses. Uh, perhaps I can't present you with that kind of data, but, but I, I, I sort of have to adopt conservation, the conservation set strategy by default uh, on the basis of the notion that 
um, the ability to produce energy uh, for national markets, is, or our ability to produce energy for national markets within any, any kind of acceptable environmental constraints is simply not great enough to have a significant impact. I don't know whether that satisfies you or not, but that's, that's the, that would be the, the data basis of the argument that I would be making. Yeah. Can I present uh, some data that's directly on point to your question? And in the, uh, I forget what month, 1996, Scientific American, there was a, it's 150th anniversary, so there was a review article of mankind's energy use. And uh, the article starts off with a statement that uh, currently mankind uses a little bit, they, at the time they said one ten thousandth of the solar energy that is falling on the surface of the earth every second. And I think that gives you a little perspective on how much not just conservation, but alternative energy there is. Uh, here we are relying on fossil fuels, and uh, with that fraction of solar energy that we're using, we're destroying the biosphere that was created with, uh, the, uh, the biosphere is created and maintained with 0.5%, half a percent of that solar energy. That's net primary productivity. And with about 1 50th of that amount, we're destroying the, the same biosphere. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, that energy is manifested as wind, as the hydrological cycle, not just as the sun itself. And there's plenty of it available. So any responses? Are there any uh, economic efficiencies in the coal and ground? Kind of tied, touted now as the Saudi Arabia of coal in the United right. States. And our reserves are, are huge. Uh, the governor's proposal is just one way to use that coal. But in view of, I mean, I guess one question is are we really that important? It sounds like you're saying no, we're not in that nature uh, of coal. And second of all, you know, are there any economic efficiencies to leaving it there? From an, from an economist's perspective, what are the efficiencies of just leaving it in the ground? Um, the efficiencies of just leaving it in the ground. What? Okay. Let me let me back I mean, up. What, what, do you, what, what costs do you avoid by leaving it in the ground? Well, I'm, I mean, one of the costs. I suppose you avoid two sorts of costs of leaving it in the ground. One one is the future. Is, the future user cost, that is, if you use it now, you don't have it later. Um, and, and that's, and that's, that's an, an, a cost which is, in fact, internal to the industry. And then there are all sorts of external costs of leaving it, uh, avoided by, by leaving it in the ground. So use the environmental water. Yeah. Kind of standard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess the question that comes to my mind is, if I mean, if we're a minor player in the energy situation and we decide to leave the coal in the ground, either deciding to leave it there in perpetuity or at least just deferring that decision until a later time, uh, is there any uh, conservation or efficiency forcing on a broader scale the national market that happens by us doing, in other words, there, there's one level which is the government makes a policy which encourages certain things or discourages certain things. And then the, the, the other level is the market is going to do what the market is going to do in response, in part to what those policies are, but in response to a lot of forces outside of it. And is there any kind of action forcing capacity of leaving this stuff in the market? If, if I understand your correct, correct question, are you are you asking me? Let, let me see if I can restate the question another way. Is, which is, is if we left it in the ground, for example, could we, because because we were failing to make that energy available, trigger presumably through higher prices more conservation? Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I again, I think that um, the the, the um, the amount of control we exercise over price is relatively small. Um, and um, 
uh, that, that, that again gets to the question of, you know, how, how, how much are we a Saudi Arabia of oil uh, or of energy production in the world? But um, I'm, I'm impressed by the degree to which um, um, mar markets transmit kind of world um, economic forces um, in, a, in a situation like an uh, ener in energy product. I, um, a kind of an, an interesting example of, of this, which it's not an energy product product project product directly, but um, an interesting example I like to cite of this kind of uh, force of uh, world market price influences is uh, came out of some research that a colleague of uh, ours in the economics department did, uh, Jennifer Alex Garcia, who um, who determined that the that it was looking at the impact of um, refugee inflows uh, on local market grain prices in, um, in Africa, and looking at a very, very remote local grain market. And the thing that she found could you know, most reliably predict the price of corn in this grain market was the price of corn on the Chicago Board of Trade. Uh, I mean, th those are very, very, very strong forces. And, 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 so, and that's what I think we're contending with. So that, um, so, so that uh, you know that that kind of um, so, so I don't I don't think we have much, you know, sort of sort of much of a handle on the on the process that way. I, I just want to say one other thing about that, and that is that I, I do think that there's an interesting question here about um, relying on prices to induce more conservation to take place, um, and it, and it goes back to a question that I mentioned previously. I think there, there is, at least among, among uh, conservation organizations and environmental organizations, there's a lot of faith that there's a good deal of cost-effective conservation out there already, okay? and that we don't need to raise prices more, that there are already multiple opportunities to, to be taken advantage of. Um, and, I, you know, I, and I think that there's some evidence that markets don't Necessarily do a real good job at capturing those. For example, we there's a there's a fairly big uh, literature on on the fact that um, that people fail to make investments in energy efficient appliances. Even though you know, you know the energy savings will pay, pay for the extra cost of the of the appliance in a in a two years or something like that. So it's a good payoff. You know, it's, but people nevertheless don't make those kinds of investments. I, and, and so I think in policies that are designed to improve conservation, particularly if the purpose of the policy is to try and help people deal with the economic impact of high energy costs, those policies have to concentrate on, on, on those kinds of opportunities. That is, the, the identification and, and uh, development of of opportunities to conserve where markets are failing to provide that. I think another you know, classic example is in the, in the area of the development of technology for conservation. Um, you know, markets are notoriously bad at, um, at uh, te te technology developments that don't have you know, some proprietary rights associated with them. Um, and so um, I think that those are areas where um, government can concentrate on, um, on, on, on trying to improve the performance of markets and, and identifying those kinds of uh, profitable opportunities, or pro pro let, me, let me call them efficient opportunities to, to, to conserve. Um, there, it's not, you know, it's not going to help people. If what you're worried about is how well people are, are doing um, in, in the face of, of the energy crunch, it's not going to help them to say force them to conserve in a way that's so damned expensive that you know that they're, they're, that it's, it's not worth it in terms of the amount of money they save. Um, so I think that those, but but I think that there are those opportunities to 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 achieve efficient conservation, um, and that that's and that's where we should concentrate on. And I don't and I don't think that um, on equity grounds that it that it's a very good. Um, Social policy to 
to, to just sort of force conservation by raising prices. I mean, we could we could force con we could force conservation by raising prices by just taxing the hell out of it. You know. um, but um, I think the burdens of that kind of a policy fall pretty inequitably across the population. So I, I, I think I would be trying to look for different opportunities. But yeah. So uh, your basic argument is that we're, we need to move towards conservation. How many states, how many countries, how many people need to be involved in this con conservation for you to think of it as a viable um, movement? Um, like the state of California has made a lot of steps towards conservation. Is that a big enough movement, or does it need to be? Well, let me let me say that I'm I'm speaking of a state conservation policy. I mean that that was my, the, the, my whole po the the point of my analysis is that I that I, that I am I'm, I'm not trying to to uh, I, I, mean, I I think we all we you know we're. we're what we're on, what we're going to undergo is 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 the result of you know what's happening in in in, in a much larger arena in the world, certainly in the country and in the world, and we don't exercise a lot of control over that. Uh, but what I've been trying to talk about here is is what is, is sort of say for ourselves, what do we exercise some control over? Okay, and so. Um, I'm saying that conservation, that 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 that, prob that what it seems to me that we can most usefully do on our own for ourselves, you know, for the for 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 people in Montana, is to conserve. I, I'm just rejecting the possibility that um, that Montana can can successfully address the problem um, on the supply side. Yeah. Yeah. Then rising prices are going to solve the problem of the lower county path dependence in the sense of that we're not conserving and that that's a new route. Are you saying that what we do need are disincentives, that is laws like we're used now not to pour used oil down our gutters thirty, forty years ago in Missoula? Are those kinds of policy tools that actually Restrictions, regulations, fines, etc. More effective. Um, I, I would have to take it on a case by case basis. Let me give you an example of where where I think we can, where where markets don't do a good job, and where individual decision making doesn't do a good job, but where collective decision making can result in significant conservation, and that's in the area of public transportation, and urban design. Um, you know, I think that, um, or or even SUVs. I mean, I think a lot of people drive SUVs because that's the only thing they feel safe in. You know, I mean, if everybody else is driving an SUV, I got to drive one. Um, you know, it's it's that arms race kind of thing again. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think I could pr probably sit down and think of lots of places where individuals making individual decisions in markets. Um, lead to sort of undesirable collective outcomes, um, and that you know markets just are not you know are, are just not the qu kind of the right place to get this done, and, and 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 how you deal with that, whether it's regulatory or incentive based or in terms of public investments and public planning processes, and if you, if you think about public transportation or urban design, that's that's one thing, and you know that I don't think that would be a question of. You know, regulating people's behavior necessarily, or, or, uh, or, or providing them with incentives to do particular things, as much as it would be a question of, um, you know, how, how you're going to invest your money publicly. I think I'm, I have yeah. to go and teach a another yeah. class. Well, thank Dick for this interesting. Talk.